Hi everyone, it's Wayne Jones, the course coordinator for statutory interpretation. We're up to week six um, in the uh, course, and we're looking at chapter six in Michelle Sanson's text, uh, Statutory Interpretation, the second edition. The uh, reading starts off by telling us that uh, we're looking at intrinsic material, and this, in this week, the statutory components. Uh, why do we do that? Well, we want to look first and foremost in the act itself before we start going outside. Um, we look at um, the intrinsic material within the uh, within the Act because we've already heard over the last couple of weeks that we don't look at words in isolation. We look at them as part of an overall context. So what forms part of an Act? Um, well, in the Commonwealth sphere, everything from start to finish, uh, according to Section 13 of uh, the Act's Interpretation Act, for the various states and territories, you're going to have to have a look and see because some parts will and some parts won't. The thinking behind that is uh, is that uh, acts are published. Now, of course, traditionally we meant published on a piece of paper in a book. Uh, and they were published by a publisher and sometimes notes could be added by the publisher which didn't necessarily form part of what was debated in Parliament. So that's the thinking behind why there was even any discussion about what does form part of an act. Um, thinking again about the way acts are laid out, you're going to have uh, things like whole you know, sections, divisions, um, um, subparts to legislation, and then right down to individual provisions in an act. So some of those are going to be leading provisions, and some are going to be more subservient. So there's look out for a hierarchy in the way the legislation uh, legislation is put together, and a good way to get an indication of that right at the beginning is um, to go to the contents page at the beginning and just have a look at the index. Just see what, what's ahead and it'll give you a feel for how the legislation is laid out. Okay, so we're talking about intrinsic material and statutory components, how acts are put together, how they appear on the page. And the first uh, comment should be about the long title. Um, going a little bit out of favour now, but still plenty of examples of the long title. And remember, the long title like a couple of other things I'm going to talk about, helps us to determine what the purpose of the legislation is. Here's a good example. The Australian Human Rights Commission Act has a long title, an act to establish the Human Rights Commission and to make provision in relation to human rights and in relation to equal opportunity in employment and for related purposes. So right up front, if you're on your roadmap trying to work out um, what your next step is with interpretation and you're thinking about purpose, uh, the long title gives you a good hint. Uh, most acts have a short title, and here's the version for, uh, or the current version for the Corporations Act in Section 1, tells us that it can be cited, in other words, you can refer to this in court, as the Corporations Act 2001. Preambles. There was a, an example given in the textbook um, for some fairly recent legislation, that's the 2013 Australian Education Act, can't really tell you what the history of this one is as to why they decided that they uh, did need a preamble. Um, can tell you that it's fairly long-winded and it doesn't always add a lot of value using words, for example, like students being entitled to an excellent education. No idea what that means, but in any event, um, it does have a preamble. You can refer to it. You can use it in your arguments when you're making arguments about interpretation, but they're a little bit out of fashion. What you're really looking for is an objects clause, um, and they are on the increase. And of course, that's because the courts have been telling us you need to look at the object or the purpose of the legislation. So the parliament is saying uh, this is uh, this is what the legislation is about, and putting it in its own clause. Much more flexible, uh, modern uh, version of um, the old long title trying to remove some doubt about what the purpose is, but don't forget the warning in the text that um, objects clauses are not the last word. They're certainly not exhaustive. Two cases given to you, Municipal Officers Association of Australia against Lancaster and Forsyth against the Deputy Commissioner of Tax. Those cases tend to show you a couple of things. One is in the, muni in the Municipal Officers case, the court said, okay, well, objects, uh, having an objects clause, having an objects section is great, um, that will reflect certainly what the chief objects of the Act are, but we still feel we can uh, 
um, consider the methods by which the legislation has implemented the objects. So in other words, as we were talking about the other day, the intention, and we can still look at other things to see how that uh, the objects were meant to be um, uh, gained, how we're going to get there, and think about things like intention. The Forsyth case, and Commissioner of Tax says, yeah, great help, uh, good to have the objects clause there, but we're still going to, uh, we, we still feel unfettered uh, that we, uh, we can have a look at uh, second reading speeches and explanatory memos so that we can identify uh, the purpose um, and supplement what we've learned by having a look at the uh, objects clause. So look, the main point, always look for the objects clause, but second, don't consider it to be the last word. More acts are having definition sections. You should look for these throughout the act. Uh, sometimes they'll use words like in this part, these words will have this meaning. Sometimes it'll be in this act. So uh, throughout the whole act, the, uh, the words will have a particular meaning. And uh, they're very useful in, in determining uh, what words mean. But again, bear the warning in mind from the textbook authors, they're never conclusive. Um, they are an explanation of a word or a phrase to assist the court to uh, work out the interpretation of the legislation. They're not substantive law in their own right. So courts can still can look at a definition and still say, yeah, but I wonder if it has, it, has that meaning in these circumstances or does it have that meaning um, um, in, in this particular uh, uh, case. The good case example that was uh, given to you was Kelly against the Crown. You might remember uh, that case was the one which dealt with uh, whether or not um, the, or it was dealing with the definitions for, um, uh, for, for whether there'd been a, a record of interview by police. Now, notwithstanding the fact that those words were defined in the legislation, the court still felt that there were some other possibilities out there that it needed to give uh, some thought to. So have a look at Kelly and the Crown. Um, definitions, uh, sometimes they will be, uh, well, they'll be intended to be exhaustive. So that might be where uh, an act says that uh, uh, something means the following. So that's meant to be a complete definition. Uh, other times when they use the word uh, includes, or better still includes but is not limited to, then quite clearly what the uh, legislature is saying not a non-exhaustive list, but uh, half a dozen good examples for you to have a look at. Um, one of the examples in the textbook uh, uh, I've put on the, the slide there is uh, uh, using uh, these words, information in relation to the identity of a person includes but is not limited to, etc. Um, here is the wording from Kelly and the Crown. Now, you would have thought that that was fairly um, straightforward. But of course, just to, to finish on that note, uh, the court felt that official questioning, even though the word means was used, was still open to further interpretation. Uh, another, um, another part of the structure of an act that you might refer to are schedules. Don't forget to have a look at the back of the act to see if there are any schedules. If you have followed my advice, you will have looked at the index at the beginning uh, to get a, a roadmap of uh, what's in the Act, but definitely have a look at the schedules. They're often used uh, not only to shorten legislation by putting detailed information in there, but um, they're used where the, the topic, the subject matter, changes from time to time. And the best example I can think of is uh, the schedules to drugs misuse uh, legislation, where um, the, uh, the landscape changes quite often, so new, new drugs are added. Marginal notes. Um, for obvious reasons, namely the Commonwealth says that everything in the whole Act um, is to be taken into account. Uh, well, they do apply, uh, they are part of the legislation in Commonwealth law, but not in, uh, not generally in um, state and uh, uh, territory legislation uh, as of right. Then you have to look at your individual um, legislation, you have to look at your individual interpretation uh, legislation to see whether they do apply in your state. Sometimes they do, and certainly they do in Queensland, but not in every state. Uh, look, punctuation, 
Um, I'm not sure how useful that's going to be to you unless you're a punctuation expert. And the case um, that the textbook authors refer to is Chew Against the uh, Crown. Um, just be aware of the fact that punctuation is part of the material and uh, be aware that in cases like uh, Chew and the, the Crown, where the comma sat determined whether or not the court found that the uh, the Crown needed to prove intention or not. So in other words, if something happened, um, not necessarily because that was the outcome that, uh, that, that Chu intended, um, then uh, Chu might not be liable um, under the, under the uh, uh, legislation, which dealt, which by the way, dealt with um, obtaining a benefit uh, from a company when you were a director. But um, if the, if the punctuation mark was in another place, intention might not be part of the uh, elements of the offence. So it is important, and the courts will look at where punctuation marks are. This was something that I think, I'm not sure whether it's still in vogue, um, providing examples, but uh, here's a piece of legislation from the Child Protection uh, Legislation. This is Section 5A from Child Protection Legislation in Queensland. It tells us what the paramount uh, principle is in that act uh, for administering uh, the legislation, that is safety, well-being and best interests of a child. And then it gives an example. Um, not unusual, not always that helpful, um, arguably, but uh, it gives you an indication of what the section is meant to mean, but not definitive and doesn't form part of the, uh, the act itself. Uh, second last uh, comment to make, just in relation to penalties, be aware that if there's a whole list of offences with a penalty at the end, so you might have three different types of fishing offence, three or four, and at the end it says something like a penalty, just the words penalty, uh, $500 fine or, or six months in prison, uh, then that penalty applies to all the different offences that have been listed above. Uh, is it a maximum or... Uh, uh, or a mandatory uh, uh, penalty? Answer is uh, usually it's just a maximum. So very rare, 99 times out of 100, unless the Act makes it really clear. When it talks about a fine, uh, that's the maximum. When it talks about a period of imprisonment, that's the maximum. So just be aware of that. So in the structure of things, you will find penalty. There will always be penalty provisions in the Act, and this is how you should uh, read them. Um, look, a couple of cases to look at this week. Have a look at Qantas and Christie. Have a look at KNS Lake City Freighters, only because I still find that case a bit contentious as to how the judges arrived at the particular decision. But have a look at it. It's a good example of one where there's a heading which says quite clearly, um, essentially, in, well, in my words, something like personal injuries, but it's, it says third party insurance. Um, but it uh, but it contained a section which dealt with property damage. So anyway, have a look at it, see what you make of it. And uh, just for fun, see if you can work out what uh, the court was talking about with respect to punctuation in the case of Chu and the Crown, but uh, definitely not a keeper. Just be aware that the courts will look at punctuation and you can make an argument out of them. Okay, that's all I've got to say for this week with respect to week six. So I hope you enjoy your reading.